And hello, everybody. I'm happy to present the research of my research group. And so we will start. So the University of Applied Sciences and Advisors in the south of Saxony. And at this university, we have our Saxon Institute for Computation, Intelligence, and Machine Learning, as you already heard. And uh, also at our university, we have an, a strategy for AI to develop AI models and apply AI models uh, in several uh, areas of application. And I am the director of this institute since 2017. In the institute, we have a methodology, a theory group, and uh, this group um, is split it in three branches. This is a theory group, the technical application group, and the bioinformatics group, which is accompanied by a young researcher group, Male Kita, for machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence and technical applications. So the theory group mainly is focused on interpretable models in machine learning, as well as a little bit of quantum computing and machine learning models for restricted hardware. In the applications, we have bioinformatics and medicine, astrophysics. So we are working with uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, experts in autonomous driving, engineering, and precise agriculturing. Um, but the today talk is uh, about smart and interpretable AI or machine learning systems. So I will focus on what is interpretable or explainable AI. And then I move to the, the main topic, which is vector quantization in this context. So we will learn about uh, unsupervised learning vector quantization a little bit, and then we switch to the supervised parts with classification learning. And this is mainly based on learning vector quantization. And I will explain these models, and particularly I will uh, then give the, the extensions of the main models for learning vector quantization. So this are what is the mathematics behind and what are variants of the basic model. Smart and interpretable AI, why we need interpretable AI. We have many regulations and norms so that uh, engineers or uh, applicants for um, machine learning systems uh, have to declare what all the tools are doing. So this is important, for example, in autonomous driving, there, there is a norm ISO 262, which, uh, you, where you have to explain the functional safety of the car. And if you have an electronic system in, inside the car, so like a machine learning uh, tool to decide something, then you have to declare, okay, the functional safety of the model, and you have to explain how this model works and how the decisions are made. Similar uh, also applies in engineering. We have the data protection regulation of the European Union, where you have to give information regarding the uh, person related data. Or if you think about clinical decision support systems, then of course the medical doctor have to be still responsible for the full diagnostic and therapeutic decisions. However, if they use a support system, then they sh uh, <clears throat> should believe in the system. And therefore, it is necessary that they understand how this uh, system uh, makes any decision. So further uh, systems we need uh, that in context of HAI. So we have to be sure for HAI that the algorithms are ready also to work with real-time constraints and data privacy. And they have to guarantee also for this restricted constraints to that we have robustness and uh, independency from maybe large power consumption. So we have many uh, requirements that we need smart and interpretable, uh, interpretable AI systems. So, but what is interpretable AI or what are the requirements for interpretable AI? So there is a... Um, <clears throat> a paper by Paulo Lisboa and colleagues who stated the following. We have first that we need explicitness and comprehensibility. And this is that the system should be able to represent the knowledge learned in a human understandable way. 
so that not only experts in machine learning can understand what is contained in the knowledge, so to say, from the system. So it should be uh, equipped with credibility and completeness. This is that only relevant model parameters are important. We need stability and consistency. So we assume that similar or equal results should um, uh, 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 yield similar or equal predictions. And these predictions should be meaningful. For this, simplicity and transparency is needed. And this is that we need a model which is as simple as possible and or it could be at least decomposed into small pieces which all are interpretable this helps to have model inspection afterwards so that we can reflect or explain how the model represents the knowledge so all these uh, um, items should lead to plausibility and trustworthiness and this hopefully also to acceptance. So if we think about those systems, then we can think about uh, explainable AI, which are post hoc models. So the decision and prediction process of the model can be comprehended post hoc by experts using additional tools and elaborate considerations. So we have a maybe complex system and then we try to explain what the model is doing. In contrast, interpretable AI is that these are under hoc methods, which is that the model is designed to be interpretable. So we do not need for these additional tools. And in fact, there is um, for more and more focus to stop explain black boxes by interpretable, uh, explainable AI. So we should take interpretable models instead. However, if we think about interpretable models or interpretable AI, then we have that we have to incorporate expert knowledge about the data or domain knowledge for the model. A colleague told to me we should not apply our excellent models but ignore the knowledge about the data or the nature of the data. So we should take this into account. We have to give uh, terms for mathematical correctness of the models to avoid plausible assumptions, which is frequently done in machine learning. When we have to verify also the robustness and the validity limits of the model and the algorithms. So we should think about margins and reject options or model self-confidence. And <clears throat> in consequence, interpretable models frequently are not end-to-end -end learning models. So the usage of pre-trained models is difficult or impossible for those systems. And the experts should be uh, taken into the loop of the model development. So we have a cooperation between AI and domain experts. So this is what is generally uh, done uh, or understood in interpretable machine learning or interpretable models. Now I will uh, think about heavy and learning vector quantization, which is uh, obtained from the basic perceptron model. We all know that if you have the pyramid cells in the brain, then this excitation or the simplest model to say is a perceptron and the excitation is just the inner product between the stimulus vector U and the double, uh, uh, weight vector W. And in data analysis, these stimulus vectors are of course our feature vectors and each weight vector determines a linear hypersphere in the data space, which can used for classification, be used for classification learning. So if we have this feature space, each perceptron defines a linear separation. And if we have several of those uh, perceptrons, which are uh, uh, combined in a network, then we can make a respective classification scheme. So what are the assumptions or paradigms? Uh, from biological motivation, we know that the higher excitation of the neuron for a given stimulus, then we have a better adaptation of the respective neuron. This was already postulated by 
Donald O'Hebb in the 40s of the last century. And if we do so, we think about competitive neurons. And the winner determination, which is usually a winner takes all rule, is that we compare different perceptrons, take the excitation, and the winner perceptron is the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the perceptron which gives the highest excitation, which is in fact the Euclidean inner product with, between stimulus and weight vector. So if we take further the assumption that we have normalized inputs as well as weight vectors, then we can see here the geometric interpretation. The stars are the, uh, weight vectors, and then we have a stimulus, and then we decide, okay, what is the closest one in terms of the inner product? And the inner product, of course, is the respective angle. So because we have normalized um, data vectors, and then we can identify the most appropriate weight vector. But if we take this into account, then we can also rewrite this uh, winner takes all rule in a minimum rule, which is that we have the minimum between two minus two times the respective inner product. And of course, we all know this is nothing else than the Euclidean distance or the squared Euclidean distance. And so we can translate the winner determination regarding the highest excitation into a geometric rule which where we represent our weight vectors as weight vectors in the data space and also in the data space are living our data vectors and now we have the minimum distance rule so we have a geometric interpretation for that so this relation was first time uh, stated by Chovo Kohon in 88 in the book Self-Organization and Associative Memory that the HEP principles can be related to minimum distance learning or a minimum um, or a winner takes all regarding a distance measure. Then the third principle from Donald Ahead was that learning of a stimulus leads to higher excitation and this is that it now relates in the setting of normalized vectors to um, lowering of the respective distance between the given stimulus and the weight vector. And this can easily realized by vector shifts. So if you have a stimulus and we determine the most excited neuron, which has a, or a weight vector, then we can take this um, vector shift and we move the weight vector towards the given stimulus. And this is also the observation that this uh, by Chiavo Cohen in this book, Self-Organization and Associative Memory. Uh, one can easily show that this relates to online learning from K-means algorithm. Um, <clears throat> but we all know that K-means is very sensitive to the initial conditions. Also, there are nowadays interesting alternatives for intelligent um, initialization of the respective weight vectors, or in this context, also denoted as prototypes. There is still a sensitivity. Therefore, Thomas Martinez introduced 93 a respective model for vector quantization based on the uh, this learning rule where we have a gradual update of all weights or prototypes depending on the winning rank. So all weights are now updated, not only the winner takes all neuron, all the others are also updated towards the given stimulus. So this is a very robust and very uh, uh, fast training scheme for unsupervised vector quantization and improves drastically the C-means algorithm. So the rank function have to, <clears throat> can be uh, modeled by a sum of heavy side functions depending on the um, distance differences between the prototypes. And it can be shown that the average learning rule is just following a stochastic gradient descent learn on an energy function. And this energy function is influenced by a parameter lambda, and this parameter lambda can be seen as a temperature, 
because the weight vectors in this model can be interpreted as gas particles and the gas um, uh, uh, um, will, um, sorry um, the, the gas can spread better to the uh, data space if we have low lambda values and this relates to high temperature so this drastically improves uh, C means learning in the limit, one can show that approximately um, neural guess optimizes the same uh, uh, objective as K means. Uh, if you decrease lambda slowly to the zero value or at least nearby. So this competitive learning of vectors or prototypes this leads to a very robust behavior for k-means algorithm for unsupervised vector quantization. So now we switch over to the supervised part, and this is vector quantization for classification learning and what are the ingredients. As before, for unsupervised, we have training samples and prototypes, and these prototypes we know relate to the weight vectors of the perceptron. So now all training samples have labels according to the classes, and also the prototypes are equipped with labels. And then we have a classification scheme, which is still the winner takes all rule. So we have to determine the winner, which is the most closest uh, prototype according to a given stimulus. And then we decide, okay, that the respective data point is labeled by the class label of the best matching prototype. In this way, we get a partition of the data space into the class regions. And of course, now the question is how to distribute the prototypes. And there's a very basic learning scheme introduced by Cohen in the 80s. So that we can initialize the prototype vectors randomly for each class. Then we present sample to be learned. If the sample then we determine the current best matching prototype. And if we have a class agreement between the training sample and the winner prototype, then we move the prototypes towards the data sample. If we have a disagreement between the best matching prototype and the presented training sample, then we push away the prototype. And this is the so called attraction repulsing scheme, which is the basic understanding of learning vector quantization of all vector quantization models. So this <clears throat> was uh, presented in this short paper by Thiago Cohen in 88 of the last century and was described as a, not as a pure heuristic, it is motivated by a Bayesian perspective. Uh, you, we can show that if we take class conditional um, density, then we can generate a respective class discriminant function based on the conditional probabilities. And then the winner determination is now that we want to maximize the class discriminant uh, function and take this as a winner take all rule. And if we do so, we obtain lately a class based data density function estimator. And all together, if we learn the scheme, then we end up with this attraction repulsing scheme I already showed you. We have early variants, so for parallel update of two prototypes and adaptive learning rates, but it is still a heuristic. One observation is that if we take this algorithm in a more formal way, we have that we have the agreement function, which defines the attraction or the repulsing. And here we have the vector shift. And we observe that this vector shift is related to the squared Euclidean distance. So if we would replace the squared Euclidean distance by another dissimilarity measure, which is differentiable, then we can take the same scheme and take as a more, more formal vector shift as a derivative of the respective dissimilarity measure with respect to the prototype vector. 
So this is a very nice observation that we can relate the squared Euclidean distance for the winner determination to the vector shape. And this observation led to a mathematical verification of the learning vector quantization approach by Sato and Yamada in 96. So the idea was to compare the dissimilarities of the best matching correct prototypes. This is a best matching prototype uh, belonging to the same class as a data sample and the best matching incorrect prototype. So if you have a data sample here, then we have the best matching correct prototype W plus and the best matching incorrect prototype W minus. And we have the respective distances. And now we take a classifier function uh, relating both distances. The classifier function becomes negative if the data point is correctly classified because then um, D minus is bigger than D plus. And doing so, we can build up a cost function approximating the classification error. So here we have a scaling function, which has to be monotone, and it is frequently taken as linear or sigmoid. And so we can approximate the classification error. For example, if you take the sigmoid in dependence on the theta value, then depending on the value of theta, we can approximate the, uh, the, steep, the steepness of this function. And so we can approximate the classification error. And we have local costs. And if we can take local costs, we can approximate a stochastic gradient decent learning. And the stochastic gradient decent learning, of course, has no to take place with respect to the best matching correct and the best matching incorrect prototype. Applying the gradients, we just have a data dependent scaling or so to say learning rate, but uh, the attraction repulsion principle is obtained also for these gradients. Interestingly, this approach optimizes a hypothesis margin. And this is very important for robustness. So what is about the hypothesis and the sample margin? The hypothesis margin and the uh, sample margin are visualized in this picture. A hypothesis margin is that is a maximum radius where you can move the prototypes within the ball, but not uh, leading to uh, different class assignments for a given data sample, whereas the sample margin, which is used in SVM, is what we can move the data point inside a ball without changing the class assignment by the model. It turns out that the hypothesis margin is a lower bound for the sample margin. And so GLVQ, this is a mathematical verified variant of learning vector quantization, endures robustness. So, <clears throat> so we have that the hypothesis margin give us some estimate what minimum perturbations of prototype positions do not disturb the model. So this we can use for adversarial robustness. So thereby adversarial samples should be semantically indistinguishable from in sense of the human cognition from original data and uh, adversarial samples detect models vulnerabilities exploiting deceptive traps. Whereas counterfactual robustness means that counterfactuals are designed to highlight the limits of the classiform model. Both uh, adversarial robustness and counterfactual robustness are important and should be considered if you apply the model. But regarding the theory, we know that the robustness and free classification certainty is optimized implicitly by GLVQ learning. So we, here we have an example where we have the adversarial data, the original data is a nine and we have an adversarial attack and we can identify what are the critical areas and so this nine is classified as a four. Whereas for the contrastive explanations by counterfactual robustness, we still look what are counterfactuals 
so that still the class <coughs> um, uh, prediction is not changed by the model. So we know from the theory now that learning vector quantization ensures this classification certainly. However, in the motivation of the learning vector quantization, it was always implicitly assumed that the prototypes are representing the classes. However, it turns out due to the repulsing scheme, this is not always the case. Uh, <clears throat> A repulsing scheme may lead to non-class typical prototypes. For example, if you have equivalence classes for, for training. So the, the prototypes become sensitive for the classes, but they are not longer representative for the classes. So we, you can take an explicit requirement for representation so that we have a combination of representation and classification learning. So you need a representation term, maybe a neuro guess like uh, dynamic for the representation learning of the prototype. And you have a classification scheme uh, for the learning, uh, classification learning scheme to, for the classifier learning. And if you have both combined in a cost function, then you can control by a parameter which influence you want to weight more important or not. So another possibility is that you, <clears throat> want to reject some data points. So we can use the margin-based reject decision because we know that our model is optimum with respect to hypothesis margin. So if we have a data point, which is just at the border between two classes, then we can take the respect of hypothesis margin or a relative score based on this hypothesis margin and so we can reject those data as well as we can take outlier reject, um, which are far away <coughs> prototypes. This can also be used in terms of one class GLVQ learning, where you have only to represent the target class and all other data is, are assumed to be noisy data or not represent uh, not target data. So then you define in respect of the visibility range which can be adapted dynamically during learning so that we have the respect uh, respective outlier detection available. Another issue is what or which of the data dimensions or which of the feature contribute to the classification. So if you want to uh, learn about this from deep networks, this might be very difficult because of the problem of vanishing gradients. So generally, you cannot decide which of the data features are important for classification in deep networks, because the weights in the first layers of the deep network are more or less very uh, loosely related to the uh, classification or regression term. However, because the learning vector quantizer model, you can take as a maximum two layered network, we are uh, able to, de to determine which of the um, feature dimensions contribute. For example, we have high spectral data to distinguish coffee types. Coffee is very important in particular for mathematicians because a mathematician is a person who transforms uh, coffee into formula. So we are very interested in what type of coffee we have. So, the high, uh, high dimension spectral data. The question, question is which frequencies do contribute to the classification of coffee? If we take a PCA, then we can see that the data heavily overlap. So the solution is that we take an adaptive projection metric for optimum class separation. And this is that we replace the standard squared Euclidean metric by a metric which is. Um, equipped with a linear mapping of the data and the prototypes. And this linear mapping is by the omega matrix. And now we can learn this omega matrix in parallel to the prototypes. So if we take this projection matrix, then we have uh, M is the dimensionality for the projection, where N is the dimensionality of the data. And if we have M is equal to N, then we have complete matrix learning. 
And if we have M is less, so in particular, if we have low dimensional projections, then we have limited rank matrix learning. So, and we can learn the projection matrix omega just also by stochastic gradient descent learning. Doing so in this example, we see that this uh, that the classes are now uh, now better separated in this linear projection, and the respective classification accuracy is improved. So we can interpret this projection matrix in the following way: this is a relevance matrix or classification correlation matrix. So the correlations which support the classification are the respective entries in this matrix. So further, we can take the diagonal or the sum of the matrix, and so we get a classification influence profile of the features. So we can decide which of the frequency contribute to the respective class decision. A problem which is related to matrix learning is that we think about data and changing environments. For example, if we want to classify rotating objects or handwritten digits, then we can say we have samples which are more or less uh, in a data manifold. And they are also representatives of some data manifold in this uh, context. So we speak about concept. And so we can take this approach that we, <clears throat> Take our prototypes as representatives of the data uh, of the manifold, whereas the data are also representatives of the data manifold. And so we have to think about manifold distances to take into account for learning vector quantization. We can approximate this manifold for the prototypes by respect to Schengen, and then we get this representation of the prototype, which is now equipped with a um, linear mapping. So we have a Taylor expansion of the manifold, which gives us such an affine part for a prototype. And now we take the respective distance as before, and one can show that this uh, is related to a matrix H, which is an autoprojector, but can be learned in an analogous way to the uh, matrix learning in GMLVQ, so we have a restricted matrix version of learning vector quantization. If we apply this for the handwritten digits, for example, we have here tangents which are estimated independently from the classes. This uh, and, and so defined more or less a priori. Then we have estimated tangents from the data. And then we have here the tangents learned by learning vector quantization. They differ because only those tangents are uh, determined by the algorithm, which contribute to the class discrimination. So what we can do, we can take the influence of the tangents. For example, if we take this tangent for one, and we vary, then we can see that all these samples are taken as the same input for the respective learning vector quantized. <clears throat> In technical applications, frequently complex value data occur. So we have wavelength transformed data or Fourier transformed data. So we want to apply these data and not to take only the absolute value of those data, then we have to deal with the respective complex data vectors. And so we need a GLVQ with complex values prototypes. However, for this, we have to uh, generalize the derivative. And this can be done using the Wittinger calculus. So we introduce differential operators and apply the chain rule. And in the final end, we get an derivative scheme, which is a directed derivative. This is not a general derivative, mathematically speaking, to deal exactly with complex value data in the model. In this way, we can uh, handle also in learning vector quantization data, which are 
obtained by engineers in Fourier transform systems. So as we have seen from these samples uh, or examples that we can apply learning vector quantization for other dissimilarity measures. So we can apply respective kernel measures. We, in, in the only requirement is that we need differentiable dissimilarities because we want to apply stochastic gradient descent learning. If you have kernel distances, then we can simply take the kernel distance if the kernel is differentiable and uh, take the respective derivatives for kernel learning. And if we do so for the coffee data, we see that we get a further improvement. This was a linear separation. Now we have the nonlinear separation in the kernel space. So we can take into account functional matrix where we assume that our data may be represent functions or time series. So we approximate them by the coefficients of the respective polynomial approximations, for example, Chebyshev polynomial, and, or we can apply a respective Sobolov matrix for functional data. In biology and in bioinformatics, frequently correlations are considered. If you take the square, squared value of the correlation, then we can take this as a dissimilarity measure, or we can take any kind of divergences, for example, the kohlbeck leibler divergence. So uh, long we assume that they are differentiable. Uh, one interesting new idea is that we also can take advantage from quantum distance learning. So if we take this as a very special Hilbert space with a respective kernel interpretation of the <clears throat> transformation into a quantum state space, then we can also apply quantum distances. And so we try to uh, model also learning vector quantization on quantum computers later. If we are interested in very uh, in non metric data, for example, in graphs or in biological structures or in biomolecules, then other distances are interesting. Uh, for example, graph kernels or edit distances, which are computation costly. So the solution is that we can take either only the respective uh, dissimilarity values into account and takes the assumption that we can uh, embed the respective data in an Euclidean way. However, for this, we need all the dissimilarity between the data, which might be impossible for large data. For this, this we can take the so-called sensoric response principle, which is that we take some send rods from the data. So these are some objects and we only calculate the respective Distances for those uh, for these uh, um, sensoric data, and then we have a sensoric representation which is a vector in the Euclidean space, and then we can apply the usual Euclidean space learning vector quantization for these data representation. So we take this uh, generation of the sensoric response vector as a particular mapping of the data into the Euclidean space. Uh, another topic, of course, is what is about probabilistic classification, uh, but still in the sense of the attra uh, attraction repulsing scheme behind from learning vector quantization. And so we have uh, the, to distinguish between probabilistic decisions or possibilistic for example, in medical context, frequently you can have possibilistic decisions, which means, for example, that the patient suffers from different diagnoses. And so for this, we can take the prototypes as generators for the respective classes and think about respective conditional probabilities. Applying the base rule, we can learn uh, respective um, conditional class probabilities obtained by the prototypes. And we can take as a respective cost function to be learned the cross entropy, as we know from 
uh, deep learning. And interestingly, this cross uh, entropy learning for like learning vector quantization sti still endures the attractive, uh, attraction repulsing principle. Okay, so I explained you very briefly uh, why we need interpretable smart machine learning models and I introduced learning vector quantization and unsupervised vector quantization as a model which was or originally heuristically motivated, but nowadays we have mathematical proofs for robustness, for uh, model uh, con uh, confidence, and also for uh, the respective margin properties, which are implicitly optimized. And for interpretable models, particular also this mathematical verification is important. Uh, to end up with an interpretable model. So the disadvantage is that usually those models you cannot learn in an end-to-end -end way without any intelligent data pre-processing, but this data pre-processing is in my uh, um, view not so important. Uh, uh, this end-to-end this -end learning is not so important because you should take into account the domain knowledge regarding the data from the experts. So thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm happy to answer your questions. <laughs>